thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, we're we're going to start now, finally. <laughs> first of all, I want to ask, how many of you are here for the first time? Raise up hands. Here where? <laughs> uh, here at Security Express, I'm not here at UiPath. <laughs> all right, Welcome. thank you for coming. Um, for those of you who are new, that over there, the person who made the ma magic happen is Anatol. And um, the person who annoyed you all that check in, myself, is Alexandra. <laughs> and thank you for coming. So uh, today is a pretty different edition. We're going to have a lengthier talk with one uh, speaker who has previously held awesome another presentation. With one awesome speaker who, by the way, has flown here from the US and also passed through several, several countries and several adventures. But before that, yeah. but before that, I just want to remind you that our talks are now up in a very uh, small and uh, easy to digest format on YouTube. Uh, Silvio, a ghostly presence who has never been at one of our meetups, has done the hard work of trimming down our videos and making them easy to digest. So thank you, Silvio. This is what they look like, with um, as opposed to the previous format, which was rather unfriendly and always like four hours long. So yeah, thank you, Silvio. And um, before we go right into the talk, please remember we have a Patreon account. And the uh, overall purpose of this account is to keep the pizza coming. Right now, we thank uh, UiPath, our fine host, for hosting us and also providing the food and the patience and the presence in this lovely meetup. And without further ado, let's make the interesting part. And um, I'm going to allow Michael to talk about himself and his, uh, his achievements, his work, and especially about video game security fails. Michael? Hey! Thank you for that introduction. Uh, so I am Michael Kasson Hall. I am uh, I am from the United States. Please don't hold that against me. Um, anyway, I do a lot of research in internet security, uh, as well as studying some of the more memorable fails and documenting them so future generations do not make the same mistakes. I don't know how successful I actually am in this endeavor, but uh, hopefully we'll all learn something today. So I've been in the industry for about 10 years. I work mostly as a freelancer contract, and my current project, as I talked about here, is developing a framework to help secure it at DNS. But today we're going to talk about something completely different. So let's talk about video game security failure. Um, as some or most of you may know, most video game consoles have fairly sophisticated DRM and encryption technologies built in, and these systems have often been undermined by pure competence. So getting right into it. Um, there's essentially been a battle between console manufacturers and homebrew developers. Uh, a lot of this comes down to the era of the Atari 2600, at least in the United States, where a lot of unlicensed knockoff games were created, such um, that badly destroyed the reputation of the 2600, and ever since then, uh, console manufacturers have very much tried to prevent unlicensed bootlegs. As a, unintended or intended side effect of this, homebrew and running your own code on consoles have uh, been more or less impossible, with a few notable exceptions. So we're going to take a look, at, this isn't going to cover all the video game consoles, because you know a few people actually have surprisingly managed to do it correctly over the years, but we're going to look at some of the more interesting uh, attempts and failures over the years, starting with the Sega Genesis or the Mega Drive, as it was known here in Europe. Um, the Mega Drive was, um, where's the wireless mic? Okay, I guess I'm standing here then. <laughs> um, the Mega Drive was one of the first console-based uh, security systems with DRM built into it. Um, at the time, uh, hardware encryption was both too difficult to uh, implement, and, at the, and the United States had some very interesting laws about in exporting encryption which made it impractical to implement uh, in hardware. So Sega tried a rather unique method to enforce a platform lockout. They implemented a system called TMSS, also known as the Trademark Security System. This specification was in the Mega Drive programming model, uh, manual all the way to the original Japanese release of the Mega Drive. Um, but the original Japanese console, as well as some of the early US Model 1s, lack the hardware uh, to, do, to implement these checks. 
Ironically, some official license games from Sega did not properly implement t uh, TMSS and actually managed to lock themselves out of the console. So, for anyone who ever had a Mega Drive, this screen may look familiar. So, how it worked was pretty simple. On Power Up, uh, TMS, uh, TMSS uh, depended on the console game, uh, the console itself having the string Sega at a specific address, uh, 1000, and that it would write the word Sega to um, an address line before you could access the visual display processor. It was the one of the big things of marketing with Mega Drive was blast processing, uh, indicating the way the video chip worked on the platform. If these actions were done correctly, the produced by Sega screen would display, and uh, the console would work normally. Otherwise, the whole thing would lock up. The theory was that since Sega is a trademark term, uh, Sega Corporation could sue under trademark law and not copyright law for unauthorized usage. Uh, notably, Nintendo actually used something very similar for the Game Boy, um, though for obvious reasons the system did not work. Um, given the fact that it, this was security for obscurity at its very best, it didn't take TMS, uh, TMSS long in the first engineer. And um, Accolade Games in the United States released several unlicensed titles, including the very popular Double Dragon. Predictably, Sega fired back, and the case uh, got went through the court system for many years. Uh, it was eventually decided in the Ninth Circuit in uh, Accolade's favor. The pres and it, this backfired hilariously on Sega. Uh, the president set forth by Sega versus Accolade is that this is a misuse of trademark law. Reverse engineering um, security lockout chips is fair use under the under US copyright law. And um, basically implementing um, these sorts of checks in your own games without permission uh, is legal for purposes of compatibility. Um, this is incidentally still legal precedent in the United States today and has gone to the Supreme Court on later cases and upheld. So, the failures we need to learn from this particular. Abusing trademark, way is not a way, uh, trademark law is not a way to control your platform. Sega, in an attempt to lock out their platform, instead managed to codify the legality of reverse engineering and interoperability of game consoles in the United States. Without any other sort of technical lockout, the Genesis became home to many unlicensed titles that proudly uh, display that they were licensed by Sega because that screen was shown by the BIOS. And as I mentioned before, it is still legal precedent today. So moving to something slightly more modern, we have the Sony PlayStation 1, which was one of the first successful disc-based uh, gaming console. Not the absolute first. So the PlayStation used standard CD-ROMs. There was nothing particularly unique about them. And they used a, the standard ISO 9660 file system. And they could even be ran in a standard PC. Uh, for those who have ever seen a PlayStation disc, I sadly don't have a picture of this on the slide. The bottom of the disc had a famous black um, look to them. The black ink is actually not any sort of copyright protection or read protection. It simply exists to make the discs look distinctive. Um, even though standard discs could be imaged in a PC, any attempts to burn the image to CDR would not go into a PlayStation. The reason for this it deals with what with uh, the CD-ROM specification, what's known as the Rainbow Books. On the Rainbow Books, define an area known as the glass cutting area. It's a small indentation on the inner ring that it can be cut by a laser or on industrial disc press, but cannot be cut by a standard uh, CD, uh, CDR burner. A burner. Um, the CD, the PlayStation 1's BIOS looked for a code that started with SCE, which stands for Sega Computer, uh, Sega Corporation Entertainment, and then the last letter was one of the following. A for American, J for Japanese, E for European, or W for the Net uh, Yahtzee platform, which was a special development dev kit that was released by mail order by, Sega, uh, by Sony. So, there was also a second layer of security that was added after the initial release of the initial one. 
for those who had the PS1, the two screens uh, that loaded up when you put the disc in was the uh, Sony Entertainment screen and then this PlayStation 1. Contrary to, com uh, contrary to uh, common belief, this screen actually exists on the disc and was part of the SDK for the PlayStation 1. Uh, and it was different for each region. This one obviously is from the American region. Um, since these images were essentially unchanged throughout the lifespan of the PS1, later versions of the PlayStation security system uh, would check for and hash uh, these loading images and would crash the console intentionally if they were not present. Um, unfortunately, Sony, in their wonderful genius, left some backdoors that made the disk-based security system uh, completely fall on its head. So the first comes down to the CD-ROM controller. So, Due to the way the controller worked, which was a separate subprocessor located on the disc controller board, the blast cutting area of each disc was only checked once on power on, and then the controller was left in an unlocked state. So the PlayStation, the original PS1 had a mechanical switch that determined if the lid was open or not. If this switch was held down, um, uh, it was possible to swap the disc out without the PlayStation 1 actually being aware of this. And by doing this at exactly the right moment in the load process, you could insert an official PlayStation disc, remove it, put a different disc in, and load right up. Uh, the end result is that as long as you had one licensed PS1 game, you could run any homebrew or unauthorized copies you want using that one disc as a, essentially a boot disc. Um, it, don't, don't, don't worry, it gets worse. Um, so over time, um, re the CD-ROM controller was successfully reverse engineered. As it turned out, uh, Sony left an entire set of debug commands in the disc controller, including an off switch for their security system. <laughs> <laughs> A convenient. <laughs> yes, um, by setting the string uh, debug, I believe the string was debug Sony dev kit or something very similar to that, to the right I.O. port, the disk controller said, okay, I'm a dev unit, I'm done, I just grabbed whatever I wanted. Um, this was used by mod chip developers to completely bypass the system security. Um, but believe it or not, this is not the biggest fail, because this at least required adding a chip to the PS1. No, no, Sony actually left a bigger back door. This is the parallel port on every PlayStation on one, except for the very last generation. And it's also the built-in backdoor to the platform. The parallel port was never officially used by Sony for any accessories, although it was used on the PS1 dev kits as a method of JTAG. Um, what the parallel port did offer was the way to override the boot BIOS. Uh, as the platform would try to boot from parallel before it would actually try and read its own ROM chip. I think you can see where I'm going with this. So, when this functionality was discovered, both the Game Shark and Action Re in the United States and the Action Replay released in Europe uh, would attach to the parallel port, hijack the boot process, and you can now run whatever you want. The system security was completely and utterly uh, defeated. Uh, because it could also turn off the security checks in the CD-ROM controller. So, in summary, um, they basically left a back door uh, to the entire platform right there behind a little piece of plastic. There was no verification of the parallel port to determine if the device was officially licensed by Sony, and um, no official add-ons ever used it. Sony eventually did remove the parallel port, although it was left on the system board, so on later generation PS1 consoles and the PS1 um, console. I know the names are confusing, but they are two separate things. It is possible to simply wire up a device to the parallel port, even though it's not physically present on the device. Um, also, because of the way the CD-ROM controller worked, the swap trick worked throughout the entire PS1 lifespan, and it even worked on the PS2 with PS1 games. So, fail, and because it required backwards compatibility, it was also a backwards compatible fail. So, let's, um, <laughs> let, let's look at the lessons that we can learn from this. By depending on the blast cutting area for copy protection, Sony essentially only prevented casual disk duplication. 
the VCA can be ran by pretty much any in industry disk press. Uh, anyone, any company that, that can officially press a disk can write this. So any knockoff company in China can make a bootleg of the PS1 game, and this happened quite a lot. Um, furthermore, because it was only checked at boot time, it was defeated by a steady hand, literally. Uh, the debug mode basically made bot checking trivial, and finally, don't leave an unsecured debug port if you are not going to use it. Just, just some words of advice, you know, from one engineer to another. <laughs> Sony again. Uh, this is going to be a running theme in this talk. So let's talk about the PS2. So the PS2 um, was probably the most powerful system of its generation. It used the then new DVD format. It boasted higher graphics, an extremely powerful GPU, and the ability to be used as a computer with both the official PS2 Linux kit and the onboard uh, Y8 Basic. This was actually used to bypass European Union tax laws, so it could be sold as a computer and not a game console at 5% VAT versus 20% VAT. <laughs> uh, the EU eventually wised up and smacked Sony with this, but it, it took the, it, they didn't do that until the PS3. But we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So it was one of the first game consoles to actually use encryption. Um, and the PS2 security model could be seen as an evolution of the PS1 model with some of the more glaring backdoors removed from the system. For example, the parallel port was gone. So first, um, at a basic level, the PS2 reused the blast cutting area just as a basic line of defense. It then took it two steps further. Every disk was burnt with essentially what was called the wobble, where the tracks were actually misaligned from where they should be according to the DVD standard spec. This wobble could be read by the, P by the PS2's DVD controller and calculate, and calculate an offset. That offset would actually form the, de uh, the decryption key for the, um, for the encrypted binaries on the disk. So in short, for a game to successfully boot, uh, it would have, you'd have to encrypt the game and you'd have to burn the disk with this wobble that formed the decryption key. This could not be done with a standard CD-ROM burner, and even in standard industry press, it would be hard for us to reproduce this. Furthermore, as an, a general enhancement to the DVD specification, uh, DVD drives can actually detect the type of media that's inserted, specifically if it's a DVD-ROM, a DVD-R or plus R, DVD video, or a PS2 game disk. Uh, and the PS2 had a built-in lockout chip that would re restrict system functionality based on the media that went in. This would prevent exploits uh, like a malformed DVD video from crashing the system and taking over the whole thing. Not that it would save the PS2 in the end, but I'm again getting out uh, ahead of myself. Once again, normal DVD burners could not change the media type bit as it was physically pressed into the media. So. The initial defeat attempts um, were a little bit more awkward than the PS1. Um, instead of using the swap, the, while the swap trick worked for PS1 games running on PS2 as the system was cut back with compatible, it did not work for PS2 games because the decryption key would not match, uh, although the disk controller would actually be full. So instead, the first mod chips um, attached to the drive controller and performed a replay attack. This would not. Um, this would let you play. The, the mod chip would basically be loaded with the encryption keys for what were known games that could be loaded with a parallel port, and then you could burn your own DVD with the uh, without the wobble, and then the the mod chip would simply replay what should have been the wobble and allow the whole thing to work. This allowed for our uh, unauthorized copying of games, but did not allow for homebrew on the console. But it showed the initial cracks in the system, uh, as we will see as a running theme. It took a long time for anyone to realize that the disk controller really needs to be more secure. But um, to, it did not allow for homebrew due to the signing requirement. To do that, two methods were eventually used and discovered, and we're going to talk about these in chronological order. So the first, for everyone who likes uh, old school security bugs, buffer injection. When you really boil down to it, uh, a video game really isn't all that different than any other piece of software. You know, and actually in some ways they're more, much worse designed because they're not built with security in mind. They're built to be fast and entertaining, not you know, protecting credit card information. 
So um, the PS2 had two external memory cards and also could use an external hard, uh, internal hard drive if you had the necessary hardware. Uh, the memory cards were reverse engineered. They were essentially a variant of the standard Sony um, MD, uh, I can't remember what the MD stands for. Uh, essentially a proprietary Sony memory stick standard that a lot of the bio laptops supported at the time. And it was relatively easy to get this, these read with an old PC when you back there. Um, as it was found, pretty much every game in existence has a buffer overflow if you look hard enough. And if you can modify the game save data, you can crash the game. Uh, so exploits took the form of loading a modified save game on the memory card, loading the game, and then hijacking it to run modified code. After this, a special shell could be uh, loaded and homebrew run. Um, this was possible for a few reasons. First, the PS2 was built around the MIPS processor. Uh, I don't remember the exact model offhand, but while it supported kernel uh, supervisor and user land like pretty much any standard processor, PS2 games ran exclusively in kernel mode. Uh, so if you could pop, the, uh, pop a game, you had complete control of the hardware. The user mode functionality of the MIPS processor, to my knowledge, was only ever used by the PS2 Linux stand. Um, and that's mostly because the Linux kernel is actually a kernel and not a game. So um, the problem with the buffer injection method is it first required, you had to own uh, an exploitable game. And sometimes this was very difficult because games would sometimes get patched and there would be no knowable way to tell what version of the game you have. Secondly, you had to start the game, um, load, load it on your PS2, load the saved game, and then let it crash and fall into your buffer exploit code, which could take, with some games, upwards of two to three minutes. Uh, so it was a pretty crum uh, cumbersome process to be able to exploit games. So, but it did allow for deeper investigation of hardware. Then, then they discovered that Sony had left a much bigger backdoor to PS2 hardware. Um, firmware updates. So this was an unexpected find because the PS2's BIOS was encoded in ROM. It was not field programmable. It, there was no way for the console to update its own flash chips. So how did Sony plan to do firmware updates? Well, as it turns out, when the PS2 boots up, it enumerates its memory cards and looks for a specific uh, type of file on memory card one to determine if it's a newer version of its system BIOS. If it is, it's copied into RAM and executed. You may notice I'm not talking about any sort of encryption or, che or checksums, because there were none. <laughs> so, um, the function, so I think you can guess where I am going with this. So unlike the parallel port, this was actually used by Sony. Uh, the problem was it was only used twice, once on st as a standalone update for Japanese consoles to fix DVD playback bugs, and a second time to allow the use of the infrared remote uh, uh, controller uh, for the US PS2. No game actually ever shipped with a firmware update. So for these two cases, you would have a officially crashed disk by Sony that you would insert. You would copy the file to the memory card, and then you would not really never have to touch it again. Uh, since it was once this functionality was discovered, and it went a long time without being discovered due to its sheer obscurity, um, there was no code signing or any mechanism to prevent uh, tampering. So not long after this discovery, MC Freeboot was developed as an alternative firmware for the PS2. All you had to do was have a PS2 memory card and a PC adapter. You could write the file to the memory card, you plug it in, console security broken. And as an added bonus to this, because the PS2 supported an optional hard drive, you could modify the, game, the PS2 to load all your games from the hard drive. You didn't need the original disks anymore. So, um, yeah, system security, not only broken, but enhanced. Um, <laughs> this exploit, ironically, lasted throughout the entire PS2 uh, release cycle, including the slim consoles that were in production when the PS3 came out. So, the fails. 
the disk controller CPU's handshake could still be hijacked. Sony did not learn from this one from the PS3, and we're going to see this come up again and again. Um, while the hard, you know, secondly, if your hardware supports multiple security modes, you might want to consider using them. The, um, the PS2 ran all its games in kernel mode. Now, in theory, this gave you a performance boost, but it also meant that a single vulnerable game could compromise the system. Uh, which is also kind of scary because the Final Fantasy XI, which was a uh, multi, uh, multi-user online role-playing game, used a network card and was proven to be ex- uh, remote code exploits could actually be used against the PS2 because of this. So, and finally, the firmware update mechanism was entirely insecure. The only reason it took five years for it to be broken is because no one knew it existed. <laughs> There is an argument for security through obscurity because sometimes you uh, don't expect functionality to be there that no one has ever used. So, the original Xbox. I'm going to have fun with this one. <laughs> so, this is a long list of fails. <laughs> so, where do I begin here? I think I need to talk about the hardware. So, the original Xbox was essentially an off the shelf PC. It had a 733 megahertz Celeron processor, 64 megabytes of RAM, four USB ports, although with non-standard connectors, and it was built around a modified Windows 2000 kernel. It was the first console with an integrated hard drive, uh, and it also weighed a pretty much literal ton. You could drop this thing out of a building, and when it crashed, it would crack the pavement and still work. Um, The hard drive is actually a funny story that the fact is that Microsoft tried to make it work without a hard drive, but they couldn't convince Windows to work without a hard drive. So they gave up and just shipped the console with it. uh, So um, that's why the PS1, the Xbox One shipped with a hard drive. Because some of the early dev kits did not have it, and they just couldn't make it work. But we're going to, let's get into the security, because you think Microsoft of all companies, you know, years of wonderful security history behind them, might know a thing or two about building a secure platform. You can tell I'm obviously being sarcastic as hell here. Um, but as far as video game security went, it had a bunch of novel firsts. It was the first console to use public key authentication to control what could and could not be used. Specifically, the early boot used by the Celeron used a special secret ROM embedded in the South Bridge, and I'll explain this a little bit more uh, later, to do early code verification. This secret ROM was burned into hardware and checked the signature of the second stage bootloader, which in turn checked the signing keys for the kernel, and so forth and so on. This could be basically seen as a proto version of what is secured today, because it essentially follows the same principles. Um, in truth of ma- the matter, the, the Xbox should have been an incredibly hard system to break because the security model on paper is actually quite strong, but it falls apart in practice. So, the biggest pro- so for those who aren't familiar with PC architecture, you have the South Bridge is a part of every Intel compatible platform. This map, everyone in this room who has an Intel powered laptop has a laptop with a South Bridge. The South Bridge essentially acts as an arbiter to the hard drive and legacy uh, support uh, systems. It, ha- it controls access to real time clock, it controls access to ISA slots, which believe it or not still exist in this era, uh, and a bunch of other accessories. It is an integrated part of the platform and has to be. So, but because the secret ROM was on the South Bridge and not on the CPU dive, it was actually possible to sniff the contact, the, the contents of it using a hardware man in the middle attack. Um, Andrew Bunny Hong, if anyone, that name should be familiar to some of you, uh, actually did this as part of his MIT thesis. He hooked up an oscilloscope between the Celeron processor on the Xbox and the South Bridge and literally dumped out the um, secret ROM as it was being booted by the processor. Um, as it turned out, the firmware in the secret ROM was encrypted with RC4, which has two really interesting notable properties. And before anyone says it's a broken algorithm, this was 2001. We didn't know it was broken at the time. RC4, though, is not a hashing algorithm. It's, um, it is an encryption algorithm. 
And secondly, it's symmetrical. So our, in other words, if you can recover the RC4 key, you can encrypt your own payload. Whoops. So that basically meant uh, you dump the secret wall, the ROM, and you can sign your own BIOS, and when you sign your own BIOS, you can sign your own kernel, and hey look, that's your system security leaving the build thing. <laughs> yep. And believe it or not, it gets worse. So because Microsoft basically built the Xbox in a ridiculously short time frame, they left some rather interesting features of the Intel architecture on the platform. Uh, they use a method known as in-circuit programming um, to be able to flash Xboxes in the factory without having to pre-flash uh, flash it. This is a very standard practice in industry, uh, normally used by JTAG. Uh, JTAG. But uh, the x86 processor has a modified way of doing this. Um, furthermore, because it was basically built around a box and PCs, there were a couple of legacy features on the Xbox left on the system board. Specifically, what's known as the LPC port. LPC is a modified version of what is the legacy ISA bus. And for those who are not familiar, ISA was the original expansion bus to use in the PC-80 in the 1980s. And this is not the first feature from the 1980s that's going to reappear in this talk. Um, but the LPC bus is used in modern PCs to uh, interface with things like floppy devices and pad of hard drives. Um, as it turned out on the original Xbox, if you grounded out the BIOS flash chip, uh, basically by just unsoldering the power lead, it would try and load a BIOS image from the LPC port. Uh, so, and because the LPC port was designed for in-circuit programming, it uh, was possible to basically snap in a mod chip. You didn't even have to solder the damn thing. So you would just open it up, put the mod chip in, it would snap into place, and you were done. So that was probably about the easiest console hacking known to mankind. No soldering required, just remove four torque screws, and you're done. But wait, it gets worse. So despite the fact the Xbox brand Windows 2000, and despite the x86 processor having a wonderful security model involving four rings, wonderful access control privileges, the whole damn thing ran in ring zero, also known as Pearl mode. Um, <laughs> in theory, this was a performance fix, but ironically, it actually made porting games to the Xbox a giant pain in the ass. Uh, the Xbox used DirectX 8.1, but if you were porting a game from Windows that ran in ring three or user land, it would have to be modified to run in ring zero um, because you didn't have wonderful features like virtual memory or you know address mapping or you know those things we take for granted on modern PCs. <laughs> so by trying to make their system faster, they they made it both more secure and more difficult to program for. I don't know what that is, but it's painful. Furthermore, the memory cards on the original Xbox were essentially USB sticks. And I, I mean this in a very literal sense. With a simple mechanical adapter, you could take a memory card for a original Xbox, plug it into a PC, and it would show up as a USB mass uh, flash device. It didn't use a standard FAT file system. It used a modified one known as FATX, which was basically FAT32 with slightly different offsets. Um, so basically the same attack used on PS2, find a buffer ejection in a game, and then exploit it worked on the Xbox. So if you didn't want to open up your Xbox for your warranty, put it in a mod chip, all you needed was a memory card, an adapter, and a copy of the game. Uh, the most common one I remember was Mech Warrior, but there were a few other ones. Uh, 007 Agent of Fire was another common one. Um, since the known exploits uh, effect only affected early boot, um, the security model of the Xbox actually had broken, you know, if you, the kernel was secure, the games would, you know, you could reinforce. So Microsoft actually tried to retake control of the platform, so they respan on the Xbox system board. So this created the original Xbox 1.6. So they basically reworked the original system board uh, and changed the how the early boot encryption works. Specifically, they changed from RC4 to what's called TEA, or Tiny Encryption Algorithm. You might see the mistake. Encryption. They removed the LPC port and they implemented hardware to make it make it uh, make it much more difficult to decode the secret ROM. 
I haven't been able to find details of what they did exactly because the secret ROM was dumped, but not by the method uh, Bunny used, which we'll talk about. So for a brief period of about six months, new Xboxes coming out of the factory were immune to mod chips and uh, hardware modding. Soft modding by the vulnerable games still remain uh, present on the Xbox as a Microsoft could not push mandatory patches to games. This is something they fixed on the 360. So they made the same damn mistake. The TEA is not a hashing algorithm. It's symmetrical encryption like RC. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> RT. I'm sorry, I've been sick for the last, for several days and I'm only now just starting to get over it. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. I know I'm going through a lot of content. What's the other one? Uh, I'll find this. Okay. So, the fact that they managed to replace one symmetric encryption algorithm with another is a failure. But they managed to increase it to replace it with something actually substantially weaker. So, ah! furthermore, the LPC bus was still physically present as pins on the CPU. It was just harder to connect to. Microsoft could not eliminate the LPC bus because it's an integrated function of the Intel architecture. You can find them on modern i7 and i9 processors to this day. But um, without the new encryption key, it was impossible to create customized payloads, so it was required to dump the secret ROM again. Um, it might have delayed breaking the console for a much longer period of time, but a legacy feature of the Intel architecture completely shot this in the foot. And for the older people in the room, this might cause actual pain. Who here knows what H20 is? Okay, so let, let's go. Let's uh, step away from video game security and let's go back to the 1980s. At the time, Microsoft, uh, sorry, Intel had, uh, IBM had released the PCXT with the Intel 8080 processor that could address up to a whopping one megabyte of RAM. So. The original 8086 processor um, was 16 bits and used something known as segmenting uh, because the processor itself uh, only had, could only address 64 kilobytes of memory at a given time. The main memory map was divided into multiple segments. When the PC-80 was released in 1984 with the 80286, it was required to keep backwards compatibility with the older PC-XT. When uh, the PC-80 also had the advantage of being able to address up to 16 megabytes of RAM, which was a ridiculous amount of RAM for that period. One of the problems they discovered was that certain applications for the XT um, accidentally took advantage of a feature known as feature wraparound. Basically, by reading off the end of the address bus, of the address space on PC-XT, the processor would wrap around, come back to zero, and start moving again. This allowed for certain fast accesses to um, programming interfaces in DAWs, and it meant that increasing the address space past one megabyte would create backwards compatibility. Intel's solution for this was what was known as the A20 line. So when, and this feature exists in every Intel and Intel compatible processor to this day. Um, when you first turn on a um, so when you first turn on an Intel processor, it comes up in what's called real mode, which is essentially an emulation of the original 8086 processor with 16 uh, 16 bit address space and addressable one megabyte RAM. So to exceed this one megabyte limitation, you had to enable what was known as A20 or the 20th address line of a MEM chip. Um, Intel implemented this behavior, strangely enough, on the keyboard controller of the PC-80. The 1980s was a very strange time for computers, okay? Uh, and this mechanism became known as A20, and essentially acted as a hardware ground. By grounding down A20, it would cause the processor 
to retain the wraparound functionality that uh, the original 8086 had. Uh, every modern operating system, and if you look in the Linux kernel, you can find it there to this day, uh, as one of its very first operations, has to set the H20 line so it can access more than one megabyte of memory. That's backwards compatibility for you folks. Just in case you still want to run DOS 3.3 on your really powerful multi-core laptops or desktops. <laughs> so, um, as I mentioned, H20 is enabled by default. Um, the fact of the matter is that the Xbox was built off off-the-shelf Celerons. Thus, they supported A20. And furthermore, at the time, A20 was still controlled by a physical pin on the processor that fortunately was no longer hooked to the keyboard controller. Uh, the technology has moved on somewhat. But um, it meant that by pulling this line high, you could do interesting things to the way the processor Games. So when an Intel processor comes out of reset, it starts reading at segment FFFF, address FF00. Now on a standard PC, that is normally the BIOS reset vector, where it can say it trains early boot code, that turns on things like the ISA bus, so on and so on. On the Xbox, the original Xbox, this was a protected encrypted memory on the South Bridge controller. But by shorting A20, you could get the process to start at a different address space. You could get to start at FFFFE00. That was unprotected flash memory. Whoops. <laughs> Lucky. Uh, there's a reason why this, th there's, a, there's an understood theory of why this happened, but I'm, I'm gonna, I'll get to that. So, once this was discovered, the Xbox Linux project discovered, uh, was able to write a special firmware by shorting out A20 and dumping the secret ROM from the South Bridge without having to do any sort of hardware modifications. Uh, and thus was able to obtain the new encryption key. Um, this still required installing a mod chip, which was much more difficult due to the LPC port being moved, but homebrew development had now been enabled, again, on all Xboxes. Um, the interesting reason is that this bug was, at, this, and this is where it gets really uh, ugly. This bug was actually known by Microsoft. The original um, prototype units for the Xbox were built on AMD processors and not Intel. Uh, the change to the Celeron was the last minute move. The AMD processors differ from the Celeron that when in early boot, if the address space wraps around or A20 is shorted, the processor will lock. Intel processors will not do this. They will just start at the modified address space and go. It is believed that uh, the engineers at Microsoft were unaware that this was AMD specific functionality and thus did not consider a 20 line attack to be uh, a, vul a vulnerability against the system. The story, the lesson learned from this, read the damn technical documentation so you know what may or may not work. But we're not done with the, we're not done with the fail train on the original Xbox because believe it or not, it gets worse. So. The Xbox's operating system was known as Dashboard. Uh, in addition to a, the Windows 2000 kernel, it had a integrated operating system of high-level system calls, DirectX, access to network controller, disk I.O., so on and so on. Essentially, it was a very stripped-down version of the Win32 API. Um, so the uh, homebrew developers were on a way that you could run homebrew code without modifying the BIOS or having to use a game export. So they started reverse engineering Dashboard, and uh, they, found, they found a code uh, exploit in Dashboard. Specifically, the font handling code for true type fonts was vulnerable to a code uh, in, uh, injection technique. And worse, font resources were near signed or encrypted. Uh, in theory, this shouldn't have been a problem because Microsoft designed the Dashboard both to be upgradable and revocable. So, in theory, this problem should have gone away. It didn't. <laughs> when revocation fails. So, I don't know how many people here have the original Xbox, but the, but the console itself did not come with support for the Xbox Live service out of the box. That launched about six months later, and the initial dashboard did not have support for that. Microsoft rushed the Xbox to market and Live was simply not ready at launch time. 
So to enable support for Xbox Live, every game that shipped with live support had a special dashboard upgrade called Live Dash uh, XBE. Uh, this live upgrade uh, would automatically update the console to support Xbox Live and would um, install the necessary DLLs and system files to the hard drive. Um, as it turned out, Live Dash had the same font execution bug. The problem was that if the Microsoft revoked this binary, it would prevent Xboxes from connecting to Xbox Live if they had not already been connected. At the time, several million disks in circulation with this bug were in uh, were present. So basically, Microsoft had the decision between screwing over most of its install base or fixing the bug. Microsoft gave up wisely. Um, so lessons learned. Oh boy, make sure your engineers actually understand security. There is encryption between hashing, symmetrical encryption, and asymmetrical encryption. They are not interchangeable. <laughs> If you are using an architecture with legacy features, make sure you understand them and understand how they can impact your security model. The A28 exploit could have easily been prevented. Finally, don't run your games in Chrome mode. I know I made this point before, but really, especially on an Intel ARC processor, which supports rings, it, it's just mind-boggling stupid. Sorry, I, I got that right on my system. Microsoft did learn from this for the Xbox 360. And uh, how am I doing on time? Uh, we can take a break at any point. I just, okay, I'm just worried I'm going for my slides a little fast. <laughs> so, the Dreamcast. Oh. So, uh, whenever you're ready, we'll take a break, okay? Well, let me, let's take a question. Anyone got any questions about the stuff covered thus far? Or want me to go more in depth into any topics? Yeah, why didn't, uh, why didn't the original method used by Barney also work after the updates? As uh, the hardware recipient. As far as I understand it, Microsoft changed the way the timings work that made it difficult to dump an oscilloscope. I haven't actually been able to find out why it wasn't possible. Um, and for all I know, it could be. I am a software hacker. I am not a hardware hacker. Uh, but Bunny, Bunny worked on the hardware of the Xbox. The A20 exploit was discovered by the Xbox Linux team, and I guess they probably found it on the older Xboxes because it came out fairly quickly once uh, 1.6 dropped. The hard part was creating a mod chip that could connect to the original, uh, to the new Xbox board because the LPC header had been removed from the board. So that I, I could probably dig more into it and find out, but uh, the problem is people don't tend to document their failures. <laughs> uh, any other questions on anything covered up to this point? Going once, going twice. Sold. Okay, let's talk about the Dreamcast. Oh boy, this, this, this one just makes me kind of die inside when I think about it. Because this one was a, just an inexcusable failure. So, the Dreamcast was Sega's final home system. It was the fourth one released overseas and the fifth one they created for the home console market, following the SG-1000, the Sega Master System, the Mega Drive, which we covered, the Saturn, and the Dreamcast. You'll notice that the Saturn has not shown up on this list. The Saturn system security survived until 2015, which is really impressive because it came out in, two, in 1995. So keep this in mind that the Dreamcast system security went down, uh, down in flames in six months. So uh, the Dreamcast, however, was a pretty interesting platform for all things considered. It was the first platform to have integrated internet connectivity. It had a built-in 33.6K modem, which was later upgraded to 56K. It had an optional added Ethernet adapter, and uh, Sega had previous experience from building disk-based gaming consoles. As I men just mentioned, the Saturn went until 2015 until it was cracked. Um, and the, um, the problem, and this really makes the failure of the Dreamcast security model just cause some serious indigestion. So let's talk about how Sega decided to combat piracy. And the way they did that was with proprietary media, which is usually actually a fairly effective way of doing it. Unlike using standard DVDs, which existed at the time, or CD-ROMs, uh, Sega partnered with 
uh, I believe, pioneered to create a gigabyte uh, read-only memory disk standard. It was essentially the standard CD-ROM format uh, encoded in what's known as constant linear velocity mode, increasing the capacity from 700 megabytes to 1.2 gigabytes. Um, DD-ROMs could neither be read nor ran by a normal PC, and they had special technology in the disk, specifically what's known as a fake TOC, to help thwart attempts at dumping the disks. Uh, unfortunately, a little used feature of the Dreamcast sunk the entire security mechanism. Why, why, why doesn't this sound clear? So, to understand why the whole thing went up in flames, we need to talk about how the Dreamcast did it. Dreamcast was rather unique that Sega provided multiple operating systems for coding Dreamcast games. There was the Sega-derived SDK environment, which to my knowledge has no formal name, but basically provided core libraries for accessing the 2D, 3D accelerators, disk reads, so forth and so on. It also supported Windows CE, which was designed and DirectX, which was designed to help port. Windows games to the Dreamcast. And this was most notably used by the port of Half-Life to the Dreamcast. Um, and this was before uh, Microsoft had released the uh, original Xbox. So when a GD-ROM is inserted, there are two files that must exist within the root directory of the given disk image called ip.bin and uh, First, uh, first read up, and the second file name could theoretically be different, but this was the de facto system. IP bin was essentially a giant configuration file. It basically set the environment, the accessories the game used, if it supported the VGA adapter, and uh, if the game used Windows CE or uh, Sega's GameOS, because the Windows CE required setting processor security rates. Yes, the Dreamcast actually used user land. Uh, but only under Windows CE. So, uh, and it also contained the name of the initial program load binary, which by, uh, by de facto standard was called first read.bin. First read.bin, on the other hand, was either the game kernel, a kernel, or the Windows CE kernel. Uh, and then the rest of the disk was either other applications or data files. So, knowing that, let's talk about a really uh, obscure feature of the Dreamcast called me CDs. So, me CDs are essentially a variant of regular CDs. They are completely compatible with normal CD readers. Uh, they use Redbook audio and have a normal data track on them, so they are Redbook compliant. Uh, they were designed to be used in both the Dreamcast and other CD based platforms such as karaoke machines. The idea is that a me CD would be have a bunch of audio on it and then you could disk or a Dreamcast, and then you have a bunch of enhanced content. Uh, some people may be, this, this is a concept that's been tried by a lot of companies and has always failed spectacularly. Um, as far as I can tell, there were only ever seven me CDs, uh, all from karaoke titles, ever created, and they were only ever released in Japan. Uh, despite ever being used in other markets, all Dreamcast retained, retained compatibility for the me CD so, me CDs booted almost identically to GD-ROMs. Uh, specifically, you still have IP.bin and first read.bin. Uh, there is no public key authentication for either of these binaries. Instead, uh, Sega used a scrambler system. Um, you know what? Well, I'm going to finish talking about how the me CD booted, and then I think we should take a quick break because the failures here kind of get painful and I think we can use some uh, uh, fresh air just to let the failure out of the room. And I, I apologize for subjecting you all to this. So anyway, <laughs> me CDs uh, were, a, I don't want to say this was public key encryption, but it was it, it's much more similar to how the PS2 wobble worked, that the given contents of IP bin and first read up bin had to be located in specific sectors on the CD-ROM for it to successfully load. And the location of these sectors were determined by the contents of these files. The algorithm is actually fairly complex. It took a long time to be cracked. But um, the Dreamcast would specifically load these sectors in that order into memory and then pass control over to first read.bit. So if the sectors were not 
properly encoded, it would load garbage into system RAM, and the whole thing would go down the tubes. Um, so that's how me CDs worked. And on that note, uh, let's take a break. I'll look. Any questions? Let's take a break. Okay. All right, and then we'll come back to this. Join the fail train. <laughs> oh, trust me, you think, you think this is bad. I, I'm saving the horse for last. I can't drink alcohol, but I'm happy to go out. Yeah, my medication. I take certain medications that react very poorly.
in their life. Okay. So, welcome back. So last time, uh, so picking up where we left off, we were talking about how my CDs boot and how they were scrambled uh, by an algorithm that prevented you from just basically burning whatever you want to a disk. The uh, problem with this was that if you could decode the scrambler algorithm, you could essentially break the system wide open, uh, and which is pretty much what happened. Uh, the hacking group Utopia managed to get their hands on a Dreamcast development unit, which are known as Katanas, and the SDK for the Dreamcast, which had really excellent documentation. I, I highly recommend that people look for the PDFs of this, because it is a good way of seeing how you should write technical documentation. The problem with the documentation is it talked in depth about how the MyCD format worked, and it also talked about how the scrambler worked, including the algorithm like that. Um, the long and short of it was that uh, the SDK had everything in it on how to defeat system security with a simple, vulnerable disk. This, uh, the Utopia Hacking Group created what was known as the Utopia CD, which was a special boot CD that would load a splash screen and then prompted you to insert whatever disk you want. This was due to a debugging feature that had been inherited from the Sega Saturn known as system disks. Uh, since Utopia disks were in the MyCD format, they could be burned by any consumer CDR unit. Uh, CDRWs in theory worked for the Dreamcast. They were a little hit or miss due to the uh, due to the reflectivity of the disk, but they do work if your Dreamcast can read them. So this is what a system disk looks like. I could not find an image of the Dreamcast one, so this is one from the Saturn, but they more or less work the same way. The system disks were, one thing that was notable about the Sega development hardware is that they tried as close as possible to be identical to the retail hardware. Unlike uh, Microsoft and Nintendo that had very specialized development kits, uh, the Sega kits were basically the same as the retail components with most of the code signing turned off in a way to run a debugger. So the system disk was, uh, you put it in, it reset the drive controller with an encrypted handshake that disabled all security and randomization checks and then uh, would prompt to insert another disk. They were used by game developers and the game and press to basically review disks on release hardware without having to have to press it uh, uh, a GDR, uh, GDROM. Uh, GD uh, wordable media, GDRs were available to developers so the, and the retail Dreamcast could read the GDR disk if it was start with the system disk. So this is how the gaming press would get uh, additional review copies. Instead of the system disk, instead of the GDR, like this happened. Uh, the system disk itself was only about two megabytes in size. So Utopia was able to recreate one in the MyCD format and completely turn off the Dreamcast security subsystem. Uh, the functionality to do this was also entirely documented in detail in the Katana SDK. So, with your security system now being turned off, a uh, bigger problem came to light. Most Dream, now this is 19, uh, 1998. Uh, most Dreamcast games simply did not fill the 1.2 gigs of a GD ROM. Uh, as such, these games could be dumped burned to CD with a slightly modified IP bin and run unpatched. Um, since it was possible to use the Utopia boot disk or a real system disk if you were lucky to bypass system security, the Dreamcast itself was actually used to dump its otherwise unreadable system form act. Uh, the Dreamcast had a standard RS-232 serial port with a non-standard connector. Uh, the intent of this was both for debugging the Katana SDK would attach over the serial port and provide, actually give, they actually use GDB, or you could plug two Dreamcast head to head for system uh, play. So, Wares groups would simply connect a coder's cable to the Dreamcast PC, put in the Utopia boot disk, put in a dumper program, and read out the entire GDB ROM over serial. A slow and painful process that fortunately ever had to be done once per disk. Uh, so basically the long and short of it, uh, piracy was incredibly rampant on the original Dreamcast and was partially uh, one of the main motivators of why Sega completely pulled out the home console market. The Dreamcast architecture, the gd ROM format, did live on uh, past the home market. It was used in the Sega Niobe 
consoles and uh, last up until about 2007, 2008. And many Naomi systems, which are essentially a Dreamcast with more RAM, are still in service today as arcade platforms. So let's uh, let's learn about, so the lesson learned from this is if you have a disk-based security method that wasn't beat, <coughs> sadder, reuse it. Um, if you're going to support executable code from CD-ROMs, security for your obscurity just isn't going to cut it, especially if you document the obscurity. And once again, don't have an off switch for system security features, please. Ah, now, <laughs> move to something a little bit more, you know, the Dreamcast failed, but at least it was a straight fa uh, forward failure. The Nintendo Wii is like PHP. It's a fractal of failure. <laughs> uh, I'm glad people got that reference. I, that makes me feel better. So let me make this very clear. These slides should be taken as gospel of how not to design a uh, secure system. So we need to, uh, to understand how badly the fail goes here, we need to break down the hardware, the security model, and the coding practices. And I, as I learned, um, there's an additional thing I need to talk about that are not in these slides. But let's talk about the Wii hardware. So the Wii was the successor to the Nintendo GameCube, and it was essentially an up-spec GameCube. It was built around the PowerPC chip, just as the GameCube was. Uh, increased the onboard RAM from 64 to 256 megabytes of RAM. It had 512 megabytes of onboard flash, um, four GameCube controller ports, uh, plus two memory card ports, an SD card slot, two, US, uh, two USB slots, uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity. The internal flash memory was encrypted with a per console key and data uh, read to the SD card by games were encrypted. Uh, the cards themselves used a the standard FAT32 file system. The individual files themselves were encrypted. So this allowed uh, you to be able to load images or music, play them on the Wii, and also have your game data side by side. Uh, this was the intended feature of the Wii. Um, to in make sure system security was strong, the Wii had a dedicated security processor known as the Starlet, which was an ARM 9.4. Um, that basically acted as a hardware arbitrator to um, the Wii's hardware. The Wii was also fully backwards compatible with the GameCube, including its accessories. So, when a GameCube disc was inserted into the Wii, the Wii would load a special operating system known as MIOS, or Mini IOS. It basically emulated the GameCube BIOS and provided certain uh, emulation mapping features between the Wii's hardware and the GameCube hardware, where they were not one one when you were running in GameCube mode, Starlet locked out much of the Wii's hardware and only allowed access to GameCube ports on the Wii. This was an important thing to note because the GameCube system security hadn't broken um, by, the, by uh, the broadband adapter and other methods. And actually because the way home, uh, backwards compatibility was implemented, homebrew for the GameCube would actually run on the Wii if you could load it. So the GameCube emulation mode for the Wii was broken from day one just due to the way the backwards compatibility was implemented. This didn't actually help break the Wii because the Starlet had locked out all the higher system functions. So there was no access to the NAND, you couldn't access the Wi-Fi controller or the rest, of the, the rest of the system memory. So the first attempt at defeating Wii system security was done by a pair of tweezers. And I'm being incredibly literal with this. So, the first, because the NAND chip was completely encrypted and the firmware updates for the system were also encrypted, the first step to breaking the system security was getting a dump of the system operating system. The way this was done was they would load homebrew in GameCube mode, take the Wii system board, and short out the address lines of the memory chip to access the parts that were not supposed to be accessible because of the Starlet. This allowed uh, the entire memory of the Wii to be dumped and what would also eventually show the epic failure of security design of the Wii that had only been covered up because uh, no one could re, uh, decrypt the uh, encrypted system firmware. So to understand the true fractal failure, we need to talk about how the Wii operated in Wii system mode and not GameCube emulation. So when the Wii came out, there were, the Wii was started by a series of three boot loaders, known as boot zero, one, two, three, you had iOS, the input-output system, and what was known as Menu, 
which provided the Wii's uh, interactive menu and certain uh, functionality such as Wii Connect 24. The Boot X uh, bootloaders uh, were, boot, boot Zero was burned onto the Starlet die, unlike Microsoft, uh, Nintendo was smart enough not to put it on a separate chip, so Boot Zero spent quite a long time not being dumped. Uh, it would in turn decrypt Boot 1, Boot 1 did live on the NAND, but it's ha the, the hash of Boot 1 was hard-coded to Boot 0, and as Boot 0 was in non-changeable ROM, Boot 1 could not be field upgraded. Uh, boot 1 would then initialize most of the system hardware and then start Boot 2 uh, after checking its signature. Uh, boot 2 was the first part of the boot architecture that Nintendo could patch in the field. Uh, this will be important shortly. So, iOS was the input-output system. It could basically be described as the kernel of the Wii. Uh, it provided um, authentication, uh, security checks, access to the NAND system memory, um, and if I remember correctly, also access to Bluetooth, the USB ports, and the Wi-Fi controller. It did not control access to the 3D hardware. That was handled uh, mostly by the games themselves as an embedded static library. Um, Wii games, uh, in my disappointing theme, ran in supervisor mode, again. So, um, unlike any sane system architecture, the Wii actually shipped with multiple versions of iOS. Games were specifically and stacked and linked to one specific version of iOS and would always use that version. For example, one of the launch titles for the Wii was Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. This was linked to iOS 9, and it would always run with that version of iOS. It, um, Wii Sports, which was actually developed later since uh, Twilight Princess was originally coded for the GameCube, uh, used iOS 11. Every version of iOS existed on the Wii system uh, NAND chip. And uh, I believe at the end, there was approximately 40 versions of iOS on the chip. Yes, that is the correct expression there. You, you might see where I'm going with this because um, iOS versions were not ABI compatible with each other. <laughs> so um, this had multiple consequences. First, it meant that Nintendo couldn't update old games to include new functionality. For example, on the Xbox 360, when the dashboard would get an upgrade, some older games would get additional functionality because the dashboard now included it and plus could include system updates. The Wii, on the other hand, because the iOS was incompatible, would never see any upgrades for a game released before a version of iOS was released. It also had no capability of patching or updating games on the console. This was actually became really notable in the gaming press when Twilight Princess was discovered to have a wonderful glitch that could completely corrupt your save file and prevent you from finishing the game, and the solution was to mail your disc back to Nintendo and get a new one. And this is on an internet-enabled console, so, you know, fail. Um, there was absolutely no functionality for pushing uh, down upgrades, with one exception. Items downloaded from the Wii shop could, in theory, be upgraded by Nintendo, but they never used this functionality to the life lifespan of the Wii. So, um, since the Wii supported SD cards, both to load media, and uh, it also supported loading and saving copy of games, um, this seemed like an obvious exploit for attack, but the um, SD card game, uh, the SD saves were encrypted. Now, this was symmetrical encryption with a key that was common to all Wii, so you could copy your data from one Wii, take it to a thread, load it on, go. At the time of release, the Wii did not support loading channels or, in fact, loading save data directly from the SD card uh, until release of 4.0 of the system menu and its corresponding iOS release, which I think was 96. I don't quote me on that. Um, so the Tweezers attack, executed in GameCube emulation mode, allowed the symmetrical encryption key to be discovered and uh, save games for the uh, Wii to be decrypted and recrypted. You might be seeing where I'm going with this, but it led to the first homebrew breakthrough, the Twilight Pack, which was really notable because Twilight Princess was the best-selling game on the Wii throughout most of its lifespan. So, the Twilight Hack was a standard buffer overflow, similar to the ones we've talked about before. In case, in this specific case, 
it dealt with the name of the player's horse, which was by default a Pona. Um, by just making that string far too long, you smash the stack and you now have control of processor after the zero. Um, tri Trilight Hack uh, basically had a loader that could execute an arbitrary DAL file or Dolphin executable or L file. Uh, and this is how we did initial homebrew on the Wii and how the initial version of Wii Linux worked. Uh, research uh, in the homebrew kept going and Nintendo was very slow to respond to this because the Wii was not, shall we say, friendly to upgrade. So Nintendo was really determined to stop homebrew on the Wii, um, but they had no mechanism to patch games or channels. So instead they added a specialized feature to iOS called Check Save ZD, which does exactly what it sounds like. Uh, what this function did was have iOS check all saved games on NAND for Legend of Zelda saves, check that they were valid, and uh, if not valid, delete them. It specifically targeted Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. It did not target any other game. And they only patched one version of iOS originally, which meant it was trivial to bypass this initial attempt at fixing it. Almost a year later, they successfully managed to deploy um, versions of uh, iOS with code that could find Twilight Pack and remove it. Uh, they, th this went back and forth about four times and intended to try and fix it, uh, and then a minor change would let the hack still work, and then so, and so on until Nintendo finally managed to put a bullet in it. However, at this point, the homebrew ship had already sailed at that port. So this comes down to the architectural failures of the Wii security model. <coughs> Excuse me. Wii applications, which are known as channels, are signed. Um, unlike Microsoft, Nintendo actually understood the concept of what a sign, the signing a package actually means. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, however, they're not signed with a public Nintendo key. They're in fact signed with a local console key. There was no public key encryption as we understand it. So if you could recover the console's local signing keys, you could sign whatever you want for a given console. Uh, as such, um, the, uh, if you create a third-party channel, it would show up in the menu and act as any other piece of official Nintendo software. Uh, and this led to the creation of the homebrew channel, which was the de facto way of installing homebrew on the Wii. As it turned out, the Wii system architecture was so stupidly fragile, it is trivial to work a Wii with a malformed package. It was so bad that this brick, uh, it was possible to brick a Wii with official system updates, uh, because they would install a channel that was slightly malformed, and the whole thing would just crash. Uh, this usually happened when trying to play in more games, because there was no actual check that you were installing the right firmware for a given platform, and it would just go boom. But it gets stupider. Um, so there was a much uh, worse security bug. So while Nintendo understood the concept of hashing, they didn't understand the concept of programming in C. Uh, the problem with this is instead of using memcom, they used stircom, which for those who know their C programming, only goes as far as the first null character in a given string before saying if it's right or wrong. This caused the entire security model to collapse. So in theory, the Wii had 128-bit SHA-1 hashes. Because they used stircom, it meant that any time the null or two zeros showed up in a hash, uh, it only would check up to that point and then stop. That meant instead of having 128 bit of uh, security, you had between four and 16 bits, which, you know, kind of trivial to make a hash collision at that point. As such, even though we had code signing, which, you know, is good fit, it was fatally broken. And worse, the early boot firmware, boot watch, suffered the same bug, and it could not be field upgraded. That meant a, modify, a replacement boot 2 could permanently unlock the system, which led to more failure from Nintendo. So Nintendo was very determined to stop out this bug. And a year later, yes, it took them a full year to actually fix this, uh, because they had to fix each individual, individual version of iOS. Um, they uh, eventually stomped out the Trucia bug. They couldn't fix the fundamental bug in boot one, so later we shipped with a fixed firmware on the die from the factory. Uh, 
a third party bootloader, a boot to bootloader known as BootMe, which was a recovery tool, um, had been released at this point. So Nintendo decided to try and override it by pushing down updates to Boot 2. And now, up to this point, Nintendo had never pushed any updates to Boot 2, and their firmware upgrade code was <coughs> slightly buggy. So, in theory, the Wii has three independent copies of Boot 2 to prevent corruption which you know, is a smart and actually good way of doing it. The problem is they overrode all three copies at once and didn't actually verify the right one. Whoops. So um, Nintendo ended up bringing up a whole bunch of Wii's that had never been modified by accident, and their support forms were overrun by users that had, whose Wii's had self-destructed because of Nintendo trying to stop out homebrew. Way to go, guys. Really. So this went back and forth for quite a while. Now, for people that successfully installed the Homebrew channel, they were completely unaffected. As it was signed with the local console key and not a Nintendo-specific key, anyone who had it installed was immune to this nonsense. The console couldn't detect it as abnormal and couldn't delete it. Um, occasionally, Nintendo would push out an update that would finally remove the Homebrew channel, generally looking for its title ID, but it would usually take all about a day for a fix to come out, and, you know, life would continue. Um, and the fix was installed before the system update. The homebrew channel was survived, uh, set up in just fine. And needless to say, system security was pretty much dead with arrival on this point. But, um, you know, not the, uh, well enough alone, people were determined to make it even easier to install homebrew. So, um, eventually, multiple, and I do mean multiple, remote code exploits were found in the system menu. That is the base firmware of the, uh, of the Wii. So you could successfully install uh, run arbitrary code without even having to own any games. This was known as Letter Bomb and Banner Bomb, um, which uh, Banner Bomb took advantage of the really poor um, architecture regarding Wii channels that it would try and load the image for a channel before checking the signature and um, using a malformed payload, crash the graphics library and take over the processor. Uh, letter bomb took advantage of the Wii message board, uh, sending a malformed message over the network and just popping the system entirely that way. Uh, Nintendo eventually gave up, and uh, as of System Menu 4.3, which is the final version, these exploits remain unpatched and always remain capable of running homebrew. But it gets worse. So we, we, uh, the Wii did have a successor, the Wii U. And the system security of the Wii was so poor, though, uh, it had influence on the Wii U. A transfer tool was released by Nintendo that could copy your game, your downloaded games and saves from the Wii to the Wii U. Uh, since Nintendo had no realistic way of detecting the home channel compared to, nor you know, compared to normal content, early versions of the Wii transfer tool would actually copy the homebrew channel and install it in the Wii mode of the Wii U. So your homebrew would get copied right along with your official content. That's just kind of sad when you think about it. So, lessons learned. ABI compatibility is an important concept that's been around for 50 years when the Wii was released. Releasing multiple versions of IO, uh, um, iOS was not only sloppy, it permanently helped compromise the system. Um, when you're using security hatches, use the right function. Using StirConf should be caught by any competent programmer. And finally, unpatchable ROM code is bad. Nintendo did not learn from this, and the Switch was broken to the same exact uh, type of bug due to the boot ROM exploit of the Tigger chips used by the Switch. I don't, I'm not going to cover the Switch in this talk, but it's an interesting thing to look up. I don't consider that a failure because Nintendo itself didn't actually cause that bug. But there are more lessons to be learned here. Uh, spending two years of effort to fix one exploit should show that your development system is fundamentally broken. Uh, furthermore, you have an internet-enabled console and no way to patch game code, your management team should be taken out back and shot. Um, per console encryption keys, good for security, but your entire security system should not depend on a single key that could cover from RAM. And finally, global encryption keys, weakness in any system. And now we get to one of my all-time favorites, the Sony PlayStation. I'm not picking fun of Sony specifically in this talk. It just happens that they managed to fail so many times in so many different ways. So, lesson one is a bit unique. Removing features is a bad thing. 
Um, the PlayStation 3 is unique. Of all the examples, it went nearly five years without being cracked. The reason wasn't because the PS3 security was just that good. No, they gave the homebrew community exactly what they wanted, an official way to run homebrew code. Remember this? <laughs> yep. As initially sold, and it was even on the box, PlayStation 3 supported Linux and other alternate operating systems. Once again, this is believed to be done to help uh, si uh, sidestep uh, EU tax code by being able to sell the PlayStation 3 as a computer and not a game console. It's um, so uh, Game OS, which is the PlayStation 3's built-in operating system, provides simple tools for partitioning and booting homebrew code and other operating systems. Uh, other OS applications ran under a hypervisor, which gave full access to the main PowerPC processor and six of the eight SPU units of the Excel processor. It did not provide access to the 3D accelerator, but the 2D accelerator was accessible. So it was limited, but only slightly. Uh, Sony also contracted with multiple Linux distributions such as Yellow Dog Linux and Canonical for uh, Ubuntu to provide mainland support for the PS3 in, the, in their Linux distributions. So for a period, the Linux, uh, Linux on the PS3 was very, very healthy. Let's skip ahead about four years after release. Uh, there was no serious effort to try and break the PS3. Uh, the homebrew community had what they wanted and the, in general, people that want homebrew or want to run Linux don't want to enable piracy, so uh, there was no need to really dig into the security model deeper. OS gave them everything they wanted. Um, however, towards the end of the lifespan of OS, an exploit was found that provided access to the three, uh, 3D functionality under Linux. Instead of issuing a security patch, Sony responded with a firmware update that removed other OS and moved it from the in development, uh, from the then in development PS3 slam. All hell breaks loose. He doesn't say the homebrew community was unhappy with this particular development, as was the US Air Force, who had actually built a supercomputer cluster around the PS3. <laughs> um, yeah, there was a lot of people that were upset about this. That this was really considered a bad idea. So the first lesson we need to learn here, and the first fail to take away is, don't piss off the entire hacker community at once. It <laughs> won't end well. So now we need to talk about RSA keys. Within a year, the entire the PS3 was entirely compromised. Uh, while there were exploits before this point, uh, the true failure of the PS3 came from implementing encryption and signing. Again, unlike Microsoft, Sony actually understood the difference between encryption and signing. Yes, I'm not, I'm not off that particular high horse. Um, but um, at heart, the PS3 uses, used RSA asymmetrical encryption hashing, which is an industry standard. It's used to protect credit card information, used in all major web browsers, and it's used to this day. Now, a technical, now Sony, in their infinite wisdom, Instead of using an off-the-shelf security library, you know, or free and open source one like you know, OpenSSL, decided to roll their own crypto code. Um, so an important thing of the RSA specification is that when you sign or encrypt something with an RSA key, you have to generate what's called a knowance. Uh, knowance is a one-time number randomly generated that prevents RSA keys from being factored. In a normal system, this is generated by a cryptography uh, cryptographically secure random number generator. On Sony's dev kits, they took a slightly different option. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so public private keys. Because they reused the Noah's uh when signing packages, it actually became trivially, fact, uh, uh, trivially easy to factor the private key uh, from the public key using, pub, uh, using algebra. The end result is every single encryption key used to implement secure boot on the PS3 was compromised, including the unpatchable code in the boot ROM. Since it was now possible to hack and modify the OS, further failures were found. Specifically, Sony trusted the client for things like if this was a development console, if this console owned certain PSNet games, and much, much more. Because there was no server-side security on PSNet at the time, a hacked PS3 could access the developer version of PSNet and leak more than a few in-development titles and actually force Sony to take down the entire thing for about two months, if people remember correctly. Um, 
since this was a rather fundamental breakage of the PS3 and could not be fixed without invalidating all games up until this point, the PS3 remained open to hacking until the end of its lifespan. So, lessons learned. Don't piss off the entire hacking community. It won't end well. Don't roll your own crypto and never trust the client. Take these lessons to heart, people. So, I'm ahead of time, so we're going to, I'm going to go into the, one of these much more in depth, but let's go for the honorable mentions. The Nintendo Switch, defeated because the Tanker chipsets provided by NVIDIA had a uh, buffer overflow in their boot raw that completely compromised the system security. The Nintendo DSi, system security should not be able to be defeated by a poorly coded Sudoku app. PlayStation Portable, which is, I'm going to go into more details about. Make sure you check that your signed code is actually signed. <laughs> <laughs> and the Xbox 360. Just because your operating system is secure doesn't mean you can blindly trust your DVD ROM drive. So, since we're ahead, uh, ahead of time right now, I'm going to talk about the port lazy support rule because this is a rather unique chain of failure that happens. So, the, PS port, the PSP came out more or less contemporary with the PlayStation 3 and uh, was one of the first disc based mobile handheld. Now, the, uh, like PlayStation 3, it used uh, signing and encryption. And as far as I know, they actually used an off-the-shelf RSA toolkit, so they didn't have public private keys like the PS3 did, which really makes the PS3 even more inexcusable when you think about it. What it did have was an integrated version of the WebKit library, which powers most web browsers in this day and age. Sony did such an excellent job of porting uh, WebKit that they even implemented the file access method which uh, proved to be a slight problem. So there was this game for the PSP called Wipeout, which was just this basic racing game that had a high score feature in it. Now, as it turned out, the high score was implemented as a simple web page that you could access over Wi-Fi, and with simple DNS hijack, you could redirect this to other places. And then by manipulating the URLs to go to, say, file colon slash slash slash, you could browse the redirectory of the PSP's operating system and download it to your memory card. Whoops. Um, needless to say, the PSP's firmware got dumped ridiculously fast. Um, through analysis of the PSP's firmware, there was a deep and in-depth look at how the binaries were encrypted and signed. The PSP supported two different types of binaries. Uh, dual files, different than the Wii, which were essentially signed executables, and then uh, ELF files with a signature uh, encryption header. The DOL files were properly checked for sig you know, signature hashing that had a valid public key signature from Sony. ELF files did all this wonderful checking and then forgot to do anything with the return results. <laughs> Whoops. So the version 1.0 of the PSP firmware was able to run homebrew completely unmodified from the memory card. So Sony, in, you know, they, let's give Sony points, they actually had the ability to update the firmware. Shipped out version 1.5 of the firmware that fixed this little back door. What they didn't implement was downgrade protection. That came later. So what eventually happened was an interesting rat race where um, Sony would release an upgrade and it wasn't a race of time to try and find a way to uh, break that version of the firmware. No, it was a race of time to find a way to downgrade back to the broken version of the firmware. And this kept going on and on. Sony eventually took the nuclear option by releasing a respin of the PSP's hardware that was physically incapable of running version 1.0 of the firmware. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 you know, let's give points to Sony. They, they, they're willing to take the Armageddon approach to all sorts of things. This did not, however, save PSP security because of the wonderful, so Sony had realized that over time, people are going to break their PSPs and having a way to do service and maintenance of a completely broken flash chip is a good and important feature to have. So an interesting feature of the PSP was that every battery has a built-in serial number that could be dragged by the boot ROM. Now, as it turns out, if a ba uh, PSP battery had a firmware, uh, a serial number of FF, 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 it would put the PSP into a special service node that would accept uh, unsigned flat, uh, firmware image from the memory card and move from it. <laughs> you may know this exploit a little bit better as Pandora's battery. <laughs> uh, the old, so uh, it became very common to use Pandora's battery 
Put a firmware image on the SD card, uh, the memory stick that supported uncut red to code, and then you could load all your PSP games from the memory card faster than they would load from disk. <laughs> oh, and you could also dump your games directly from the disk drive to your memory card, so you could have uh, all of them in one handle, or you know, borrow some of the disk, give it about five minutes, and uh, hand it back. You're done. You now have your own copy of the game. And once again, there was no security or authentication with PSNet or DLC or anything like that. So to say the console was broken was wonderful. Now, obviously, Sony kept trying to fight back, but eventually they gave up and even published an official uh, QA article saying use of Pandora's battery will not damage your PSP because it's identical to what Sony was using in the repair shops. <laughs> that, that, that's setting up the white flag, folks. Um, there were further attempts uh, to patch the firmware to prevent it from loading from memory stick, but instead of trying to get the newer firmware to load from memory stick, um, people just backported the functionality to the old firmware that would load just fine, and that would allow new games to work without having to bother of updating the firmware. And this could all be downloaded with the web browser built into the PSP. Basically, you had a one-stop shop for completely owning your platform and manipulating however you want. So, and that, so, lessons learned here. If you're going to have signed and hash code, great. Check your return statements. They don't, you know, return codes are an important part of life and should not be ignored. Secondly, downgrade attacks are a thing. Th uh, try to prevent them. Third, if you're going to have a, a servicing backdoor is a great thing. It lets you do all sorts of repair things. Don't make it stupidly easy. You can make a Pandora's battery by opening up the battery and, and grounding out two address lines of the chip. It wasn't like this was a complicated path. You could do it with five minutes of a screwdriver. Uh, and fourth and finally, you know, don't screw over your community. I mean, you know, by pushing arbitrary firmware updates to try and block homebrew, that all, all they did was have security updates, something that Nintendo was also guilty of. So that's how the PSP went down in flames. Uh, any questions or should I go into more of the honorable mentions? Anyone want to hear about any in particular or any other console that I may be aware of? Did any console that did it right? Uh, surprisingly, yes. The Sega Saturn actually did it right, which was the predecessor to the Dreamcast. Now, the, the Sega Saturn was a very interesting and strange beast because it had six independently programmable processors. So I'm not exactly sure the security method lasted as long as it did because it was really that secure or if it was just that, in, uh, that unintelligible to normal human beings. Um, <laughs> there is a fine line. There is a fine line between secure, uh, security through obscurity and security through insanity. <laughs> but uh, we'll talk. Let me talk about the Saturn for a little bit. So the way the Sega Saturn's security method worked is that each individual disc was used the glass cutting area, as I mentioned before, uh, the PS1 used. It also used the second security ring on the outer track that had to be present, that could not be uh, replicated by a normal disk press or CDR burner. If that was not in place, the system would refuse to boot from CDR. Furthermore, because the system architecture was so incredibly screwy, even though you could load a GameShark with cartridge port, it could not disable the game security of the Sega Saturn. Now, there was an off switch for the Saturn security, but then we could figure out how it worked, because the system disk uh, was present. As far as anyone could tell, the system disk had a special bytecode in its outer security ring that could not be replicated that turned off the controller instead of the main CPU turning off the controller like you played or drinking cast the system disk did. So the way the Saturn security was eventually defeated is that the Saturn had an optional add-on card for video CDs, and it turned out it was possible to trip a um, to trip the CD player on the um, Saturn to running game executable code by using a modified um, uh, VCD chip. Uh, basically what this guy did is he built a custom um, field programmable gate array uh, daughter board, plugged it in, and then get found the buffer overflow in the built-in operating system of the Sega Saturn that then let him run executable code from the desk. This was done in 2014, nearly 20 years after the Sega Saturn first shipped. So if that isn't what I call uh, a strong security model, I don't know what it is. Although, again, the insanity part also has a strong bit to play with that. 
Uh, any other questions or other consoles people want me to talk about? Going once, twice. Oh, okay. So a friend of mine told me this story that there was a guy that had a repair shop or something like that, and he would mod a console, but I don't know which kind. The way he would do it is that uh, you'd bring the console and he uh, and he will uh, tell you to play for a couple of minutes like 10 minutes 15 minutes uh, this was uh, in order to warm up a specific location on the chip this is the Xbox 360 <laughs> okay. the Xbox 360 uh, did fall I don't consider it a fail because of how it was broken but let's talk about it and the 360 does show up for a completely different reason, but so let's let's talk about the fail and then the, the not fail. So the 360 security model was uh, basically the Xbox original model, but done correctly. They actually now knew how to do code signing. Um, so the Xbox 360 was remarkably uh, difficult to run home to run. Even to this day, it is still difficult to get arbitrary home to run. It is, however, remarkably easy to run pirates, uh, pirate, uh, pirate copies of games. The reason for this is that the CD, the DVD-ROM controller on the 360 does authentication and checks for the security features on each individual disk, and then reports a status code to the main processor if it's okay or not. That was the entirety of the security mechanism. So all a mod chip had to do was override the functionality of the disk and then give a false signal to the CPU saying, hey, I'm okay. And that's, so the, the, the Xbox 360 became really notable. I mean, the first console where it was trivial to run backup copies of games, but not run homebrew. That's because the backup copy had all the right digital signatures, but the disk controller was a failure. Um, the Xbox 360 security was actually beaten by a hardware attack. Um, the, the Microsoft did learn from the original Xbox and put the secret ROM uh, of the 360 on the CPU die. The way it was, and furthermore, they implemented e fuses on the board that prevented downgrade. Every time you upgrade the dashboard, the processor would actually blow out a fuse and prevent, and the older dashboard would refuse to run even if you could flash them. I'm sorry, I suddenly congested. There was also individual uh, cost of signing keys and lots and lots of other security features that made it very hard to break the 360. What ultimately did the 360 in was that if you undervolted the main CPU and then sent reset signals at certain intervals, you could get the processor to skip opcodes. And by doing so, you could actually get it to skip over the verification check for the signature, for the uh, uh, encryption signature. So by doing this, um, the chip would basically be reset constantly over and over and over again until it glitched in just the right way that it would skip the verification uh, signature for the boot ROM and then load a third party boot ROM from a mod chip and then completely defeat system security. This was known as the Genesis exploit. Um, I don't consider this a failure of system security because these type of attacks are very hard to defend against because you're essentially manipulating the electrical lines to the processor and undervolting it to cause undefined behavior. While it can be defended against, I mean, NASA actually suffers from this problem with cosmic radiation doing horrible things to CPU processors. Um, it's not a failure of the, you know, it's not glaring they did something wrong. It's just, it is really hard to type it, defend against those type of security attacks. So, I mean, a similar type of attack would probably work on almost any major uh, console on this day if you were really determined to pull it off. Any other questions, comments? So, if I remember correctly, after uh, uh, warming that spot, he would uh, see it on a uh, temperature camera or something like that, and then would. Uh, screw that po the point. Uh, part of the way the Genesis attack worked is it also had to overheat the chip. It was a really, sorry, really specific attack. So this this sounds like the Xbox 360, although some of the details get slight, seem slightly off to me. The Xbox 360 was also notable on how badly designed the hardware board was that chips would manage to desolder themselves from it. Uh, it would run so hot. Uh, this was the famous red ring of death that people would probably, may or may not remember because it gets so hot that the GPU would physically unsolder itself from the main board. <laughs> so I've got a couple other failures uh, if you want to talk about how we do it in time. 
well, we, we can stop at any point. If you have something interesting, we'd like to hear that. Okay. Uh, give me a moment. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I don't know if I have any of the video game camera. I'm hoping for some community ideas. I know quite a bit of failures and lots of topics. I don't know what people want to hear about. Okay. Or maybe we can get to the questions. Okay. So I think on that note, uh, we'll wrap it up. Yep, that's the last slide. Um, I thank you all for your time, and I hope you enjoyed and learned what not to do when designing secure systems. Um, I'm glad to answer any questions uh, after the break, and uh, let me hand off the microphone. The people who have been here before know what's coming. <laughs> Get your phones out. And please fill in this very, very short survey. It's even shorter than it usually is because we only have one speaker. Don't worry, the QR code isn't bugged. <laughs> There's a certain number of our community who keeps trying to mod the QR codes that he gives me when I check him in. He's not here today, thankfully. Yeah. Which one? The Terminator console. I'm not, I've never even heard of that one. <laughs> so the problem with the great political mix-up of 91 to 92 is that a lot of products from post-communist countries never made it over to our side of the shore. So if I don't know about something, I can't poke hold, I can't point fun at it. I'll show you. OK, maybe we'll have a follow-up of um, of communist computer failures. <laughs> All right, if you're done telling us how you've enjoyed this talk, then uh, feel free to network with us. And by networking, of course, I mean BGP. <laughs> oh, I can do it and talk about BGP security. I was at R43. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone.